I'm Matt Gilhooley, and this is The Life Shift, candid conversations about the pivotal moments that change lives forever. Hello, my friends. Welcome to The Life Shift podcast. I am here with Liam, and I think you're in another country. Yes, if the accent doesn't give it away, I am all the way over in the UK. Well, welcome to the Life Shift. Uh, We've been talking for a while to get you on the show, and and our connection actually started on LinkedIn. And I I guess I was just following you because you are in the podcasting space, and I saw you make a post saying, I want to essentially, it was like, I want to be more vulnerable. I want to get out there and just start sharing my story in front of the microphone, you know, like, or not in front, but I guess behind the microphone mm. and kind of put yourself out there. So I was like, Hey, come on over. Yeah. And do you know what? I, it's, it's such an, 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 an isolating career working in podcasting. And often, you know, people think because it's podcasting, because it's broadcasting that, uh, anyone who works in podcasting is so comfortable and so, um, so good, at, you know, in front of the mic uh, and, you know, public speaking and, and, and all that jazz. And, that's you know that's not the case most of us who work in podcasting are actually very quiet introverts that just like to sit in a dark room on our own all day um, and not talk to anyone I, I I agree and I think a lot of people don't really realize that right they think that they open their podcasting application and they play it and they're thinking it's just someone sitting in front of a microphone just talking to someone else there's a lot of work that goes behind a podcast Oh, there's so much work. And, you know, uh, kudos to everyone that works in podcasting. You are unsung heroes for all of the the hours of just sifting through ums and ahs. And no doubt, uh, Matt, you're going to have a lot of that in this episode as well, um, which the Nobody listener obviously hear won't hear. But, um, you know, I think as well, hosting a podcast, it's such, it's such a talent. And people don't realize that because generally podcast hosts make it look so easy, you know, and, and you as well, like the, the, the episodes of, uh, you know, anyone that's listened to this podcast before it probably sounds so seamless and just so um so natural and that's mainly because you get some awesome guests on but also because of all the work you do to make it sound like that i appreciate that and uh for anyone listening i didn't pay him to say that so <laughs> this is uh this is a really good uh, a boost an ego boost but anyway so i'm so glad that you came came on today because i think that your story will resonate with a lot of people or it will help people that are still searching, right? Because, you know, your story is really about falling into something or finding something that really just lit your fire and filled your cup and kind of changed your entire life by, by finding that. So before you, you know, kind of hint us in on that, can you give us a little bit of, of kind of like what your life was before you, you hit that life shift? Yeah, of course. I mean, I guess I've I've always defined myself by the fact that I'm I'm an introvert. I'm I'm painfully shy, um, quite quite socially um, uh, awkward, and quite anxious. And that's really how I remember my childhood and all the years before, you know, this this shift. And you know, I I remember being this kid who was too scared to get on a bus to school in the morning so I would you know I, I was I, I was quite truant you know I missed a lot of school during sort of really important exam years because that anxiety just took hold and I was too shy and I just for no mm. reason besides the fact that I just um I felt very insecure in myself I couldn't get on a bus you know and and just go that half an hour journey to school um and that you know that that was quite a big deal and um and it got to a point in my life and I think it was when you know everyone around me had 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 left secondary school or, or high school um and you know they were going off to university and college and doing their thing and kind of making their life for themselves and I was sort of stuck at home in the same town uh just kind of working at a bank that my mum got me a job at um because it was you know better than not having a job while I figured out what I wanted to do and uh, there was just it it got to a point where you kind of realize okay like something something has to change and you've you've got to it, it reaches a sort of impasse where you've got to force that change and 
even if you're not comfortable doing it, you've got to pivot and just go in another direction and see where life takes you. And and that's really the the purpose of that's that that's really what informs that 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 big shift in my life. Yeah, was there was there like a moment where it was like this is enough where you cuz I mean growing up if you're you know so anxious to the point of not going to school and not doing the things that maybe everyone else around you is doing not that you should have to do what everyone else around you is doing I'll put that out there but was there a point where you were working at this bank day in and day out doing you know just kind of going through life as it was was there something that like triggered you to be like okay this is enough I I think you know it's I love hearing about these big stories where people have these like huge epiphany moments and like suddenly life makes yeah. sense and they have this clarity and yeah. and like that's amazing for people that have that experience but I I really didn't it was it's more of a cumulative effect you know you get stuck in this rut yeah. and before you know it mm-hmm. you know a year has passed and you, you you sort of have this moment where you take stock and think you know what is happening and I think for me where it really started to feel like something had to change was you know I I didn't just get the job at a bank where my mum worked she ended up being my supervisor for a period so it's like Mm. I just felt still (laughs) like this little kid um who got you know right sort of handheld through um through life by his mum and um and I didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to be 40 and still like living with my parents and, you know, wondering what happens right. in my life. Um, and, and I think that's when I realized that, you know, those, those changes had to be made. And, and in my case, yeah. you know, it was something quite, um, un, un, unplanned. You know, I, I had a few days off of work. So I was sat at home and I don't know how it works in America, but in the UK, there's a uh, results day when, everyone who's um, finishing school gets their exam results and it's at midnight on that day that there's this process called clearing um, and the organization that manages all of the university um, applications and acceptances um, they they release a lot of like last minute places so it's basically all the places on courses that couldn't be filled by 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 universities th- through the normal application process kind of get put out there and you can just apply um like last minute and um and so I was off work it was midnight I was up and I thought okay let's just have a little look see what's going on see what kind of um weird courses uh, uh are out there um you know I was looking for things like uh like you know golf um course management sort of really crazy stuff like that um just to amuse myself and then uh, I I noticed the course that I applied to a year earlier uh, which was film and TV production um, over in uh, York, mm. um, which is a, an amazing city. If you're ever in the UK, go to York. It's lovely. Um, but this course was available and I, I, I got rejected from it a year earlier because I, I just didn't have the grades. You know, I was I was always playing catch up after, mm. you know, being off so much. Right. So I thought, OK, let's just chance it, apply through this clearing process. And within sort of 24 hours, I'd been accepted and I was getting ready to move kind of 300 miles away. Um, and, and within a month, there I was. I was in York starting uni and it was all just, it was all very sudden, very last minute, no real planning. Um, right. And I guess that was That must have been an experience in itself. Yeah. And I right? think... I mean, because the way you described yourself, like that, that's a lot of anxiety, like to pick up and move somewhere else to start something brand new yeah it's it's a big change but I actually I I, th- I think in this I, I I feel like this would apply to a lot of people out there who are quite um quite anxious and overthink things that I only I only did that because I didn't have a chance to process what I was doing um and I can say that about several moments in my life I mean um fast forward like five years and I kind of booked a plane ticket on a whim and went backpacking around the US for three months I wouldn't have done that if I'd have actually slept on it and thought about it the next morning (laughs) I these these things I think sometimes you just have to kind of go with that spontaneous instinct and and it can change your life and and in my case moving up to York was the start of that 
Yeah. And you were going into radio and television or was that more on the production side? Yeah. So I, I was studying film and TV production. And, oh, film um, and TV. So I was always looking for things that I could do, you know, little work experience, odds and ends. And, you know, I was quite, um, you know, I, I, I was an introvert, but I, I like to keep myself busy. Um, so I was sort of looking for things that I could do and places I could apply to, to, you know, start getting work. And um, that's really what led to, I guess, the life shift moment for me. Um, yeah. And it's it's a funny one because a lot of the guests on your show um, I'm quite jealous of because they have these big moments and I'm like, that's amazing. They have these great lives and these huge like shifts and and like I'm 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 quite envious of that. For me, it was more this incredibly innocuous thing that I think it's I think it highlights the importance of that butterfly effect and of just like, mm -hmm. you know, you you don't realize the tiny moments that end up defining who you are and what you do 10, 20 years down the line. Yeah, this one, I mean, and and you falling into it too. Like if, had you not, you know, had you not been up at midnight, right? At that moment in time and then thought, oh, well, maybe I'll just look to see if there's some golf course management courses that I could take or a program <laughs> or, you know, like had you not even done that piece, right? The butterfly wouldn't have taken you to to this moment in which you discovered like, wow, this is the thing that I want to do forever. Absolutely. And like, why, why stop there? We can go further back. You know, what, what was it that made me think, yeah, do you know what? That's, that's the week that I'm going to have off work, even though I have no plans whatsoever. What compelled me that day to, right. to um, request that time off work? You know, what are the events that led up to that? You know, it's, it's, you know, you can go back and back and back mm -hmm. and back and get so carried away. Right. But I think, all of these huge moments when you really like dive deep and, 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 and trace it back, start from this like massively insignificant moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's similar to this journey into podcasting for me, it really stemmed from, I mean, if I kind of trickle it back, just being really bored during the pandemic <laughs> and, and not in the way that other people have started a podcast, right? So I was bored and I was always trying to find something to do. So I started doing digital art and I created a bunch of coloring books. And I was like, well, that's not very fulfilling because, you know, there's a million books on Amazon. So then I was like, well, I'm still bored. So I signed up for a, a master, a, another graduate degree because I just needed something to do. And then sure, I could take whatever classes they told me to, but I made a point to choose the classes that scared me the most. And so early 2022, I picked the art of podcasting and we just had to do an assignment. And I was like, well, I'm just gonna launch it, right? So it's like all these little things really stem yeah. from me just being bored. And now I'm having like the most fulfilling thing that I've ever done in my entire life. So I, I get yeah. that, you know, those I, little little moments that like, what if I had taken a left? <laughs> exactly, and I, I love the fact that, that this, the whole podcast sort of stemmed from a a, a, a university project, and I also <laughs> love that you were able to take the art of podcasting as as a module. Like, right. I, do you know what? I, as a bit of a tangent, I'm so baffled, but kind of admire the 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 US like college system because you guys kind of pick a major and then just kind of you can do whatever you want like over that then three years. It's like the UK is so much more rigid. Like you pick a oh, course really? and. And that's it. That's what you study for three years. Like you, you go there to do whatever and you can go off and, and, and do like the art of podcasting as like a side thing. Like that's amazing to me. Yeah. I mean, I think there's good and bad to it. Right. I mean, we have typical university age You're you know, you're going at 18. What do you really know? What do you really know about what you want to do except for what you've seen your family members do or the people that you idolize do? And then you get in and then you sign up for a degree program in hospitality management. And you're like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, we do have these choices, but sometimes it takes us in like we have, you know, 20 different classes that don't relate to anything. So when we get mm -hmm. out, we're kind of screwed as well. So there's a <laughs> there's a good and bad to it. Yeah, I guess. But I, I love that, though. I love that you have that choice up to like uh, uh, the freedom like that late in life, because like over here, like even by 16, 
once you do that first set of exams, you then have to narrow your mm. academic studies to like four, four courses. Um, and, and, you know, some people pick like, you know, maths, English, chemistry, whatever. Other people might pick, you know, business, media, whatever. But you're narrowing already at 16 when I really don't mm. know if we're like, like self-aware enough at that age to know exactly what path we want to go on i don't know if we should be narrowing our academic options down to just like four subjects yeah yeah and i can imagine like someone like you described your childhood there's a lot of anxiety in that because i think you know having had anxiety throughout my life and always thinking what if or what if this happens, you know? And so I'm at, I'm imagining at 16, they're like, okay, pick what you want to do for the rest of your life. Good luck. I would be like, well, what if I did this? And then this happened and then this happened. Yeah. So you're right. That's, that's really challenging. And we do have the freedom here to kind of choose and change. I think I changed my major, my first, in my bachelor's degree, like four, five, six times. Cause wow. you don't know. Yeah. That's then you amazing. also waste a lot of money doing a lot of classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do have the so luxury anyway, so you, of not so having you, tuition fees as high as you do. Well, there's that too. Yeah, we have some yeah. good options. I will say when I was going to school 20 years ago, it was I was it was free for me because I I was the student that did as as well as they could on everything to get the free ride. So thankful mm. for that. This one I paid for, but I'm older now. I can do that. That's fine. <laughs> but we'll go back to your story because because I, I want to hear like how you fell into what fills your cup, like what really just drives you every day and, and kind of has changed your life. Right. Yeah. So I guess this feeds into what that 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 sort of life shift moment for me was, because, yeah. um, you know, I, as you know, as a kid, very anxious, very kind of unsure mm -hmm. of myself, really lacking in confidence and moving to uni was the first step for me to, to and this is going to sound very kind of emo very teenage angst but I didn't know who I was you know and it right. I, I think going to university was as much a process of me kind of figuring out what I want to do as it was you know trying to get a job um and I you know first year of that I was I was terrified you know every every day I'd go back to 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 my bedroom and and I'd just be kind of sat there like what am I doing like I don't belong here everyone else is like making friends and and you know building these big support networks and here I am mm. like going back to my room on my own every night and and you know I, I felt so out of place and I I'm sure that I'm not an exception I'm, I'm sure so many people who who make this big change you know at 18 and and move away from home and start this life at college or university or, or wherever um, have that moment. And, you know, I guess partly it's imposter syndrome, you know, you're there mm -hmm. and you're studying and you're suddenly given this independence, you know, academically and financially to kind of manage your own life. And you just think like, whoa, like I, I, I can't handle this. I am right. not meant to deal with this right now. Um, so it's a huge learning curve. And there were times when I definitely felt like, I just, I'm not meant to be here and I'm going to go home. And I came very, very close to just packing up and, and coming home during my first semester. What what really changed for me was a pretty innocuous email that I sent to one of the, the faculty members. Um, he worked in radio. He, he, he was sort of quite active in the media and he sort of, he's one of these, more of a part-time lecturer. He'd come in and do some practical mm. sessions with us. Um, so I dropped him an email and I, you know, I said, Roy, Roy Player was his name. And, you know, if, if, if he ever listens to this or someone who knows him ever listens to this, then, then, you know, Roy needs to know that, that this guy has basically changed my life. Um, and he doesn't even realize it. I, I sent him an email and I just said, you know, have you got any suggestions? I want to, I want to do something. I want to, I want to just try and get some work or keep myself busy or something. And he emailed back and said, I know a couple of guys who run the local hospital radio station. Why don't you get in touch with them and see what you can do? And I don't know if hospital radio is a thing in the US or anywhere else in the world, but they're, they're essentially um, not-for-profit, kind of volu volunteer-driven radio stations that broadcast to a very 
um, small area. Um, in this case, it was to the local hospital. So, um, you know, it was very, very kind of um, very local, very, very good cause. You know, a lot of volunteers would go there, not because they, they wanted careers in radio, but because they just wanted to do something good for their local community. So, you know, hospital radio is an amazing thing to do. You know, people, you know, go around the wards every evening collecting requests from patients so we can give them a a shout out on the the live show in the evenings it's a really it's a really amazing way to kind of connect patients with the outside world and um it's got a lot of bad stigma because it's like quite you know badly funded and generally mm. the, the the quality can be <laughs> you know questionable at times um but during the pandemic you know when everything was locked down right. um uh, a lot of the time you know people in hospital couldn't see their friends and family so services like hospital radio became so valuable in in just connecting people in the hospital with their loved ones outside the hospital um so it's a, it's such a such a great thing and I'm, I'm i guess i'm kind of getting ahead of myself here the, is that <laughs> kind of, is it well i question about that is it more like a talk radio or is it also music and stuff like that or how or is it like a podcast like it's kind of it's so it's it's radio and it's it's mm -hmm. most of the time it's it's 24 7 um, and it broadcasts a mix of everything um so every every station has its own kind of identity but generally it's you know a mix of music radio talk radio you know it's very much led by the volunteers that are there and and, and the content that they want to produce okay. um you know and it's such it's such a great cause and yeah you I've know never heard of that before so it's interesting to hear yeah yeah and there's there's a real kind of institution around it in the uk and um it's a really good springboard for people to get into into right. radio as well um and that's really i guess kind of goes back to my story because yeah you know this this little email that i sent to a, a lecturer thinking oh you know like last ditch effort to kind of do something you know that triggered an introduction to the people at york hospital radio and I, you know i was saying earlier how people you know have these big kind of epiphany moments um and i didn't think i did but i guess i was partly lying there because <laughs> when i when i first walked into that radio studio i did have that clarity i did have that moment of yeah this is this is this is where I can shine and this is where I can really, you know, be me and, and get the best out of myself. Um, and that's where it all changed. You know, it was because of going into that local, you know, hospital radio studio that I kind of stayed at university. It's because of that, that I then got work for the BBC a year or two later. It's because of that, that I then, you know, started exploring audio production and a few years down the line, moved into podcasting, um, made the connections that I did and had the career and the life that I have. And, you know, when I when I think about it, it, it all just started from that one little email that I sent from my bedroom yeah. at 11 o'clock at night after a couple of glasses of wine thinking, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> right. What's next? Was, yeah. did it, when you walked into that studio, did you feel like a sense of like, home like you belonged there this was a space or was it more the technical aspect like you were excited to do the whatever they were doing I think it, it was it was definitely the environment you know mm -hmm. it's it's hard to explain and I, I don't think any of us can really put our finger on it but when you sometimes just walk into a room you're you enter just an environment work or personal or otherwise and you just you you get it. You just, you, you, the, you just know that you feel comfortable there and yeah. there's something about it that just speaks to you. And for me walking into a radio studio for the first time, that was, that was that moment. And I, 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 I suddenly knew that that's, that's where my life was going to go somehow. That's amazing. I mean, that is a big, that's an epiphany moment. That's like, we go back to this butterfly effect, right? Of like, had you not looked up stuff at midnight, had you not sent that email when you were just feeling super desperate and like, I'm done. I, I, I don't belong here. This, I haven't found my space yet. You know, whatever that means. Have it. I don't know that I have either, but you know, like it's, <laughs> that's, had you not sent that email, had he not responded? Mm. Yeah. Like what, 
do you ever sit back and go like, where would I be right now had this gentleman not responded to this email? Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. And we can, I mean, we, we can all just, you know, step back and just take a look at the lives that we have right now, you know, good or bad, and just yeah. kind of think, you know, the, the 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 chances of everything in the universe playing out over the history of time so that every sequence of events happens in such a way that we are here right now doing what we're doing i mean that's like that that's mind blowing to think of mm-hmm. and i think you know I, I don't think we we step back and 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 appreciate enough that uh, sometimes we can get so fixated on these these little problems and and our sort of our first world problems of you know the, the supermarket doesn't have the the right kind of pasta that I want for tea tonight um, that we we do lose sight of the big things like that. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a lot harder to in situations or in experiences like yours. It's a lot harder to to find those moments to see like where each door opened for you and closed. Whereas someone like myself, you know, I experienced a great loss as a child. And that was like, like, clearly, my life was going to change from beginning to end. And that's how I thought. But then I talked to a friend of mine who lost his mother, uh, like around 12. And his experience was completely different. You know, and you're like, okay, you know, like, it's what we do in these moments and how we look back on them and and what we we find grateful from those moments Mm -hmm. and your story is very similar i don't know if you listened to an episode with my friend chantal but she was having a bad experience in school and she was ready to drop out and she told one of her instructors or one of her teachers and he pulled her in and was like you can't do this write three poems we're going to submit that and like just that conversation had he not been there that day she probably would have dropped out of high school you know so I, I love that that your I mean really your life changed because of that email. Yeah, and do you know what Chantel's story really I, I I can relate to that so much. I loved that episode, and it just I think speaks volumes about how you know we can we can reduce these big moments in life to to the idea that you know it's it's you make of it what you what you choose to make of it. But sometimes mm-hmm. we we don't know what we're capable of of making out of situations, and you know we need someone to take us aside and tell us that we've got this or that we've we've we're better than we believe we are in that moment and you know I can say that as 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 a a terrified teenager who who honestly felt like I wasn't worth as much as the other people in school because they were getting better grades and they just seemed to get things more you know that they had better social skills you know I felt like that person who wasn't capable of the things that I wanted to do and you just sometimes need someone to say yeah you are yeah and here's what you should do go yeah you know here let me open this door to the studio for you what did you do when you first started there at the Um, studio so I uh like like any of the volunteers uh our, our first job was to go around the hospital wards in the evenings and collect requests talk to patients and I mean, that in itself was really humbling because, you know, you talk to people who some of them have just, you know, broken a, a you know finger and others are, you know, in more vulnerable situations. And um, you really you you hear a lot of stories when you're walking around a hospital and your your only job is to talk to the patients. Um, so, th- right. you know, that that really kind of brings you down to earth. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I, I take the song requests back from the patients to the studio and we uh that we then find the songs we had this big kind of uh, a whole wall of vinyl records uh, because it was all these you know donated records uh you know these eps mm-hmm. and um and it, it's crazy like people don't appreciate uh, a good vinyl now but we had this whole wall of like and i don't know how much those records were worth but they, we had like like originals from you know Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and all, wow. all these crazy, crazy records and um, um, yeah, it's uh, but we you know at the time um, I mean we're talking two thousand and six two thousand and seven, um, you know radio and podcasting and you know the whole audio industry wasn't just wasn't like it is now, you know 
we can we can make this podcast from our homes now because we have the technology to do so but back then you know even keeping a radio studio afloat you know we had we had a little computer a couple of um you know vinyl players and we were like we had to get the record out of the library we had to queue it up we had to press the button to start it you know everything's like digital and easy now but you know running a radio station even just a a a small one like that was was a huge task Uh, and people did that and kept it going for 50 years before i even walked through the doors and and that's that's just just amazing that people do that for free and and spent their time just so they could provide a personal service to the patients that that needed it um and then you know over time they would train me up to do more and and i'd learn how to operate the the radio desk um i'd do some sort of co-hosting duties as and when i i needed to uh, and then eventually i had my own show which um oh, wow. which was a disaster because i i'm a, a, a terrible presenter but uh, i really enjoyed being there yeah well and that's nice too like something small like that gives someone like you the opportunity to learn all these ins and outs whereas had you got like an internship of some sort or apprenticeship at a big studio you might have only been the person that you know takes out the trash or whatever that may, you know like a, just a tiny yes. little job but it's like a startup almost it, a startup environment of like everyone jump in it's time to help exactly and you know i just a couple of years you know after that point i got a two week work experience placement a a, 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 a huge you know a radio production company uh, in london mm-hmm. and it was it, you know it was unpaid obviously um but i went there And I was basically just running errands for two weeks, you know, I didn't really learn how to do anything. I was just making tea. I was keeping, you know, guests happy. I was running around London, delivering flowers to people. I mean, you know, it was, you weren't doing anything in audio. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think really for me, you know, the lesson that I got from that, and I'm, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to, to, go into hospital radio because it really taught me that um no no opportunity is too small and sometimes it's those it's those small things that seem not worth our time or just you know there'll be no no value in that and it'll just you know uh, that'll be boring or pointless or whatever they're the things where we can find the most value and and often you know it is better to be um, a big fish in a small pond because you can make more of a difference and you can you 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 know you have more of a chance to do all of those things that you think you're going to get the chance to do at right. these huge companies and you know i think often we we rush we want to we want to complete our career and all our life goals so quickly that we we forget to just take those little steps right and those little steps are the ones that make that success later on so much more valuable, right? Because we've mm. experienced all these things along the way. And I was also thinking when you were telling the story of, about like kind of your first task of going to the hospital and talking to the patients, that was probably a learning experience in itself as well, right? Because you were such, you know, were you, you know, as an introvert, like now you have to go to these strangers that are in vulnerable positions, right? And show compassion and empathy and talk to them about, yeah. you know, whether they're going to tell their story to you or not. You can't really predict that, I'm sure, right? Some of them don't want to share and some of them might want to. <laughs> but did, did you learn a lot from just that experience? Did that make, did that change you? Absolutely. And yeah, just being face to face with people, you know, you can't just, you can't just walk into a hospital, stand in front of a patient and just not say anything. I mean, they're like, okay, who is this guy? He's not wearing a, he's not wearing scrubs. I don't know what to make of this. And you, you know, you've got to say something, you've got to start a conversation and that's, that's on you as the person approaching. So yeah, yeah. It, it, it teaches you a lot of skills. Um, and I guess it's much the same for anyone that, that, that does any sort of live broadcasting as well as, you know, the, the following few years taught me is that, you know, when the mic's on and people are expecting you to say something, you know, no one's going to save you. So it's, it's on you. You've got to fill that time. You've got to start that conversation and say something. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a steep learning curve. Yeah. Well, and so nice. It's, but in the sense that you're in this almost 
safe space because as you describe this hospital radio, it's, you know, underfunded and volunteer based. And so like, if you're going to make mistakes, I mean, it feels like that's the place <laughs> that you're allowed to kind of find your way without huge consequences, not to diminish anything that you guys are doing, but it's kind of more of a safe space. Had you gone directly to BBC? Yeah. You know, Absolutely. there'd probably be a different experience, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So how did you get, how did you get to like kind of where you are now in the, in, in what you're doing and share a little bit about, I know you just launched something big in your world. So I'd love to yeah, hear more I mean, about that because selfishly I'm, super obsessed with the podcasting space <laughs> yeah and it was it was a, a long and definitely not straight road to get from from my hospital radio days to where I am now and you know a yeah. lot of it involved you know working back in finance you know I, I I left university you know I so I I graduated in 2009 and you know you're coming out of university 21 years old the the global financial crisis has just like destroyed everything you know we there, there were no jobs there was no opportunities and suddenly this this idea that we could go to uni get our degree come out and just have the career of our dreams it it, it didn't happen and you know I'm not alone there there's thousands of people that were in the same boat and it was tough you know it it was it was a, a, a harsh reality check that life doesn't yeah. work out the way you expect it to so you know I, I i did a bit of traveling i i i did a master's degree i went back to university to do that and did a few jobs along the way i worked in marketing i worked in retail um i i i spent literally um 2 hours working in a call center um and then thought nope that's that's definitely not for me smart choice yeah um so yeah, there was there was a lot of twists and turns, and and but I always knew that I wanted to 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 be doing something in the media, ideally in um, radio at the time. But um, you know, it was tough. The you know, the jobs weren't there, the money wasn't there, uh, and it's it, it's hard to get your foot back in the door. Um, mm. So, uh, but I, I guess I can never I can never regret that journey that I went on, and all those you know odd jobs and those you know sort of maybe choices that I sometimes regret a little bit and think, you know, has sort of delayed my, my career progression because, um, you know, again, you know, going back to these innocuous moments, it was, it was moving back from university. It was going back home. Um, it was, you know, helping my dad, you know, on a, on a boring Wednesday to take up the tiles from one of our rooms so we could refloor, um, and deciding after three hours that we were going to have a break because we were both bored and we like coffee. So, you know, we went to the local coffee shop and that's where I met my wife. So, you know, it's had I had I got a job at the BBC straight from university, I would have stayed in York. Right. I might never have met my wife and had the family that I have now. So, you know, life has a habit of just throwing you a curveball and um, you don't know that it's actually going to work out for the best. Right. Do you think that I mean, I know you say like you don't regret any of those. Do you think those moments were just helping to confirm what you actually wanted to do, like going through finance and marketing and all the things that just were just a paycheck to you probably, right? And reconfirming like I got to find that that feeling that I had at the hospital radio again. Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, there's it, I think we all wish that we can just fall into our our dream job and, you know, be happily ever after straight away but for most of us that doesn't happen and I I, yeah. I I don't regret that and I don't think anyone else should regret that you know we're, we're gonna do some things that we don't particularly want to do uh, we're gonna have some bumps along the road um, but you're right it's character forming and it it, mm -hmm. it gives us the reassurance that that end goal is worth it and you know had I not had those challenges along the way uh, I you know, maybe I wouldn't appreciate doing the job that I do. Yeah. So what are you doing now? So now I'm a full-time nice podcast. Like yeah. <laughs> loved it. Loved it. Uh, you're a natural. Uh, uh, yeah. So now I'm a, a podcast producer, um, an audio director at um, the Podcast Boutique. Um, must get that little plug in there for my CEO, Lindsay. She'll appreciate yeah. that. So we've just launched a new podcast network as well called Emmeline, which is specifically aimed to represent female and non-binary podcasters 
uh, which has sort of come at a really good time, you know, in the industry. You know, we 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 recognised this about a year ago anyway, because a lot of the clients that we have um, at the podcast boutique are um, women. They're generally um, entrepreneurs or you know business owners, and we kind of realised that there was this big gap in you know the podcast charts specifically uh, for female podcasters. You know. You, you see them a lot as co-hosts, you know, or, and you, right. you particularly see women podcasters in the kids and family section, right? You know, every other genre, science, there's like no women, sport, there's no women, kids and family, all women. Um, so there's this real kind mm-hmm. of gendered um, sort of divide in, in the industry. And I don't, I'm, I don't think that that's intentional. I don't think any of us, you know, meant for that to happen, but I think it really highlights how we as listeners probably um have this still have a very ingrained bias towards the people we trust about certain Mm -hmm. subjects and we we really wanted to try and do something about that and sort of level out that gender gap in in the industry which is why we launched emmeline and there's a lot of other companies out there that are doing similar things and we i think you know credit to to the podcast industry as a whole you know i think it's a massively supportive and collaborative industry and I think we're all still kind of we're going through this journey uh, in an industry that's had a spotlight sort of put on it mm-hmm. when we're still very much in our infancy. We're still working out kind of the, the sort of the nooks and crannies and sort of the the sort of the, all the minutiae of how the podcast industry is actually going to work. And we're still in this massive process process of sort of innovation. So. I think one of the natural issues we have in podcasting, which we're now trying to address is that of, you know, fair representation and diversity in the industry. Uh, And that's something that I think affects every industry, but it's one that podcasting is particularly keen to address. And um, I guess we're doing our little bit with Emmeline in in providing a network and a space for uh, female and non-binary podcasters to, to collaborate and support each other. Um, and we're particularly keen to find podcasters in those genres like science and sport and business right. and tech where women are underrepresented um, so that we can help them grow and monetize. And that's something that, you know, other networks are not really doing at the moment. Yeah, that I mean, that's a it's a great thing to elevate those voices that are not represented. I mean, you look at this podcast, the podcast industry super collaborative it's just also really interesting because there's not enough that i don't know enough about it but it's just like you know you you can go to 50 different places to listen to the same podcast and like (laughs) only the super popular ones are the ones that get you know the monetization in some capacity that will Mm -hmm. allow you to pay a bill and uh but i love what you're doing and what you said was interesting to me that i never drawn these dots in my life before uh so you said you know kind of we're drawn to the voices that we trust Mm. right and so in certain areas and so i'm I'm taking a little tangent but throughout my you know my mom died when i was eight and i remember distinctly in my teens my dad came to me and he was like why do you only listen to music by women artists and i never really thought about the connection to my mom passing and like what I most of the podcasts that I listen to are women led, like all the true crime that I listen to, all women run, yeah. you know, hosted, produced, those kind of things. I guess I'm just drawn to that. And I think the connection is the loss of my mom and mm-hmm. kind of finding that voice or that comfort. So it's really interesting. And I and and I like that you know, you're creating a space where these people that are, you know, where people can find these trusted voices a lot easier than kind of lost in the mix, right? You know, because these podcasts exist, but by you creating this network and pulling them together and helping them grow, then they're at equal playing field. Yeah. And I think, you know, that was, so that was interesting to me to think about that. (laughs) Yeah. And I, you know, that's, that's precisely why we're doing it. You know, we, there's, there's a lot, of female podcasters out there with some amazing, amazing content. And 
I, I still think there's a gap. You know, I think the recent study by um, Sounds Profitable, which anyone who works in podcasting, I'm sure has heard of. So they did a report earlier in 2022 that, uh, identified that only 29% of podcasters identify as female, only 2% as non-binary, uh, mm-hmm. which means 69% of podcasters identify as male. Obviously, that's disproportionate. It should be 50-50. Right. And, I, you know, I, I think one of the problems is representation. You know, opportunity as well, definitely, but podcasting is so accessible now for people to do um, that I think it really comes down to support and representation, you know, helping those people who are new to podcasting yeah. to develop content that works and to give them the support and the tools they need to grow their show and get it found because, you know, discoverability is a buzzword in the industry at the moment. And, and rightly mm-hmm. so, you know, we're at this point where, you know, there's millions of podcasts. So the question isn't, can I podcast? It's it's how can I get heard? Um, right. And this is where we're seeing this disparity in the industry where, you know, typically the male podcasters are more established. They have uh, existing audiences and fan bases. So, you know, they, they get picked up by the bigger networks. They get that support that the smaller podcasters, generally women and other non-male, non-white groups don't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now you're creating this space. And you just recently lo- launched us towards the end of 2022, right? Mm. September? Yes, we launched just, officially in I mean, we're September. recording this a little early, but <laughs> <laughs> we're a little ahead of time. Uh, you know, and it's it's interesting because you've now created this network where you're helping underrepresented people that have amazing content, probably amazing shows, to be seen and heard. And it all... If we look back, it all stems to, you know, sending an email late at night. It's, it all centers around like late at night, it seems, like you're late at night <laughs> looking for, for your university position spot and then late at night sending that email out. Had you not done those things, had you not, had you fallen asleep a little early or had an extra glass of wine, you know, like you would, this, this life has taken you to help these underrepresented people. like. It's crazy yeah. making those connections. I mean, it's it's mad, yeah. And, you know, we can think, what if? And, yeah, you're right. Like, if I just went to bed a bit earlier that night, I none of this would have happened. And, right. you know, I, I think I, I, I'm also very conscious, you know, obviously we're talking about Emmeline. Um, you know, I'm I'm incredibly grateful for, for the position I'm now in in life, for doing a job mm-hmm. that I really love. Um, and for having the opportunity to 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 pass that on and help others get their chance in the industry, um, but I'm also very conscious that you know I'm I'm a, a straight white male, and you know right. I I certainly there is a there is an element of privilege in that you know, and I, I'm I'm conscious that I've worked very hard, and I'm very proud that I've worked very hard to get where I am. But there's a lot of other people in this world who have to work a lot harder than I've had to just to even get an equal foot in. And, you know, that's something that I think we can all address and we should all be working to change that. Um, And that's something that I, I, I think really informs the work I do now. Yeah. Well, you, you're, you're doing good things and I love that you wanted to be more vulnerable and, and share your story I think what's great about it is there are so many people that are searching or they don't feel like they belong in a certain space. They still haven't found what excites them. And what I get from your story is like, just do the little things, do the next yeah. best thing that the next thing that interests you, some of the things that are not going to serve you in the way that you want them to, but they are part of your journey and they're going to help you in some capacity. So I think I think it's great and it's inspiring that you that you are where you are because where you started the story and talking about you know how you wouldn't even get on the on the school bus. Mm. So yeah. going back to that, I like to end the episodes with like a question. So I'd love to think about if you could talk to Liam that you know was skipping school because he was just so 
not ready to to go to school what could you say to him now with with all the journey that you've been on do you know i think the one piece of advice that i would have given to to that younger me would be that nobody else cares as much about me as i care about me you know so i can be anxious about getting on that school bus but you know why 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 was i scared there's no need to be scared you know i'm the only person who thinks that everyone's looking at me when i get on that bus mm-hmm. and everyone else is equally uh, as self-interested as i am you know so if i'm scared other people are going to be scared of other things maybe not of getting on the bus but they're going to have their own concerns they're going to have their own problems you know so i think it's so easy to get lost in 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 your own kind of uh you know lack of self-worth sometimes and your own lack of self-confidence and on all these issues that are going on in your head that you you lose sight of the big picture sometimes um and i think also more succinctly um i would tell younger me to just say yes you know don't you know get on the bus just 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 say yeah I'm going to do it and get on the bus say, yeah, I'm going to talk to this person. You know, it's, it's those moments, which I, I, I wasn't consciously thinking of where I was like, yeah, I'll just send this email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just book a flight. Um, yeah, I'll just go get a coffee. You know, that's, that's when, you know, I, I found the career I love. That's when, you know, I, I, I went on, you know, a a life-changing experience. That's when I met my wife, you know, it's all of these moments that you, it's when you don't think and you don't over process that life tends to take you in the craziest uh, and most amazing direction. I, I mean, I don't know how to end the podcast after you saying that. I think it's, it's so profound and something that we all could do a better job at. And I think sometimes we just get way too caught up in our head and worried about what other people are saying when like you point out, they probably don't, they don't, aren't even thinking about you, you know, and you getting on the bus. So thank you for being a part of the life shift podcast and for being a listener. That's super awesome. I'm, uh, I love that you recognize some of the stories. So thank you for fulfilling my, uh, journey. And, and like I said before, this is, I've never done anything that's brought me so much joy. So I understand your story and finding that spot. Uh, so thank you for being a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And you know, it's a pleasure being on the podcast. Uh, I, I, I don't consider myself a presenter, so uh, I'm sure I've dragged the caliber of your show down, but I would encourage everyone to listen to every other episode. It's a wonderful show. I appreciate that. And if you are enjoying the podcast, I would love a rating and review from anyone listening. Uh, Apple Podcasts, that's the best place to write a review. I don't know if it means anything, but it sure boosts my day when I get one. So thanks again (laughs) for listening, and uh, we will see you next week. I'm Matt Gilhooley, and this is The Life Shift, candid conversations about the pivotal moments that change lives forever.